All right, so welcome to Astronomy Club. It is Friday, April 17th. Time is continuing to hold weird meaning for all of us, even those of us who studied time. <laughs> um, it's like I'm busy, but I'm not, and days are flying, yet they're not, and uh, it's all relative, as Einstein would say. But uh, we are here. I am glad you're all here. We are going to talk some astronomy. So welcome to Astronomy Club. If this is your first time here, this uh, started because I used to do a planetarium show that was for half an hour every day when I worked at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science years and years ago. And we did a free, just random planetarium show. Nothing scripted, nothing planned. If you had questions, you could come. Otherwise, you could just sit back and relax and look at the stars. Unfortunately, we don't have as calming an environment as a planetarium right now, but I hope to bring some of that joy to answer your astronomy questions and uh, explore the stars and forget about other responsibilities for a little while. So thank you for being here, even if you're just listening in the background. If you do have specific questions or things you want to chime in, please do not hesitate to jump into the chat. Uh, I love kind of answering stuff. I have, you know, about like half an hour's worth of stuff to talk about if I just talk right at you. <laughs> um, but if you have questions, then we'll plan on, I'll plan on being here for an hour as long as you are here with me. So uh, we are going to kick things off by talking about some stuff that hit the astronomy news. One is really exciting, I'll get to in a little second. The other is uh, interesting and uh, is a positive update. So there is a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx, which is traveling through our solar system right now. It was sent to go recover a sample from an asteroid and bring that data back. That is cool for many reasons. <laughs> Last week we talked about how asteroids are an, an important component when we study the history of our solar system. They're almost like fossils of the early solar system because especially the rocky planets were very close to the sun so we are bombarded with radiation and there's also been time for atmospheres to form. There is tectonic motion which causes layers to be replaced over time. So these planets have evolved since the beginning of the solar system about four and a half billion years ago. And they no longer look like what was there when the solar system originally formed. So if we want to study the formation of the solar system, looking at comets or asteroids is a really good way to do that. And we have gone to study these objects before. The key with OSIRIS-REx is that it's actually going to land on an asteroid, take a sample and bring it back, which is really exciting. The most recent sort of interesting thing that we've done in this realm was um, the Rosetta spacecraft and the Philae lander. And those were back in 2014, I want to say. They arrived at uh, 67 trimoff Garamasenko. I think I still have. I try that every time. I should like write it down before I <laughs> try to bring it up. Um, but that spacecraft, Rosetta and Philae, we could talk about it in more detail on another on another stream. But if you have questions, I do highly recommend if you haven't seen them going to the European Space Agency. They were European Space Agency spacecraft and lander and watch their videos about the Rosetta mission because it will rip your heart out. <laughs> Their PR for it was so good. And they basically told the journey of Rosetta as if it was a um, storybook. Yeah, so cute. And they were publishing them as it was going through this mission because it took, I think it was like 11 years or something to actually get to the comet. And this was a comet that they were studying, um, 67 Churimov Germasiko. And, um, so they had time to kind of, you know, put these things together, but then they were updating it as the mission was progressing. And if you remember this mission, this was the one that they, we're just going to talk about it now. <laughs> this is how we roll. Uh, this was the mission where they were going to go visit this comet so they can, you know, it was in a good location. It was a good, you know, we thought it was a decent size. It would give us information about the beginning of our solar system and as they started to arrive at it, they noticed that it wasn't round, that it looked like a rubber duck, that it looked like two 
balls that were like stuck onto each other and it did look like a rubber duck and the Rosetta spacecraft was supposed to orbit it for a period of time before landing the Philae lander on the surface of it to get data and then it was going to get this data send it back to Rosetta and then that would be transmitted back to Earth just all the data would be sent um, not necessarily sa not samples themselves and when it got there and it saw how weird this object was there was kind of a bit of a concern because it was supposed to orbit it for a few cycles, you know, for quite a few cycles, take pictures, take data, um, send that back before land and find a place to land, take pictures, send it back to earth where they would, you know, look at the images and find a good place for this lander to land. And, uh, but because it was shaped so weird, they had to redo like all their orbital dynamic calculations because the gravity around this comet was so bizarre to be able to get into some sort of a stable orbit around it. Um, but long story short, it did uh, go and land. And because it had such low gravity, the Philae lander was supposed to land on this comet and it had like spikes that in its feet that were gonna shoot into the surface of the comet. Great idea. And these things were gonna shoot into the surface and then it would be locked down. And so they had taken all these pictures, they were finding a safe place for it to land and again this was back in, in 2014 and as the Philae lander landed it didn't end up landing straight down so when it landed it shot out the little harpoons to land on the surface and not just bounce off but it misfired and knocked it off and it flew into a crevasse <laughs> it flew into like the shadow of a sort of mini cliff face again it's small but small relative in space terms like it's still a decent chunk of rock and so it landed on its side <laughs> up against a wall in shadow. So it, solar panels meant that it couldn't get as much sun as it was supposed to to live for as long as it was supposed to. Anyway, they're continuing to do these cartoons at the European Space Agency. And it was beautiful, but it was so sad because <laughs> we were all really attached to this like anthropomorphized comet lander. And then they actually animated it landing on its side in the shadow and then running out of battery. And anyway, it was really beautiful and I highly recommend you go look them up. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a link down into the bottom after the fact, but otherwise it's the European Space Agency YouTube page. High, high, high recommend. Anyway, um, so this OSIRIS-REx, the reason we're talking about that is because OSIRIS-REx is a spacecraft that is at the asteroid, so not a comet, but an asteroid, Bennu, and it is intended to land, to take a sample, and come back, which is a big deal. So it is at Bennu now, it is at the asteroid, and what happened this week is that it has reached its closest point. So it's in orbit. Like I was saying, the Rosetta spacecraft orbited the, um, the comet before it dropped Philae, it's kind of orbiting, it's getting into its, um, it's getting into its orbit right now. And so the, it reached its closest point, which is 75 meters over the surface of Bennu. And uh, that's pretty close for space. And it is going to land on August 25th is when it's supposed to land. So we still have like four months, but it's got lots of data to take, lots of pictures, lots of sensors, um, lots of information. And then it will return and it should get all things going right. It should get back to Earth in September of 2023. So just how space creates existential crises in astronomers when we realize how long time is and how small we are and how big space is. Similarly, when you actually work as an astronomer, projects just take a long time because space is really big. So it's going to have to make its way back to us. Uh, I can't show you it now because it's behind my camera, but I have a poster called The Chart of Cosmic Exploration, which I also highly recommend, but it shows the paths that all of these spacecraft, all of the spacecraft that we've sent into the solar system have taken, and it's pretty cool, but it takes time to, to get back to us. So it'll be interesting to see how that mission unfolds. Yay! Yeah, 
it's a it's a great poster. It's really really awesome, and it just shows how we use gravitational slingshots and all that fun stuff. Um, so again, if you uh, recently joined us, if you haven't seen this before, we're just kind of doing a free flow astronomy talk. I'm going to throw up some planetarium software in a little bit. We're going to have a more in depth discussion about Mars, but we're just kind of doing the news of the week right now. But if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in there. And thank you for being here. Um, the other big news that kind of dropped on a lot of people's pages was the announcement that we have found a new earth size habitable zone exoplanet. So exoplanets, it's, this is one of those things where a lot of people who don't necessarily follow astronomy news or have an astronomy background, see these headlines and they're like, cool. I don't really know what that means, but that's why I'm here. So Goldilocks exoplanets. Yes. Um, so this data, let's go through what a Kepler, what a exoplanet is first. Really briefly, I've talked about these before. You can check out some of my videos on the cosmological address, but these are planets that are going around other stars. So we have our solar system with all of our planets and our dwarf planets and our asteroids and comets and all of those. That's our star system. You have planets around other stars. Those are what we call exoplanets. So any other star system, if it has planets around them, we call them exoplanets. The Kepler telescope was a telescope that was entire mission was meant to search for exoplanets using light curves. So it would stare at these stars. And I talked about this a little bit last week, but it stares at the stars. It sees the light curve dip a little bit and then carry on. And it's dipping by fractions of percentages. But that's an indication that something passed in front of that planet. And if they see that dip happen on a regular basis, that means there's a planet orbiting it. Now, Kepler was decommissioned, God, I want to say 2018, but that feels like a really long time ago and it doesn't feel that long ago. But time has ceased to mean anything. <laughs> so the Kepler telescope was is no longer taking data, but we still have a lot of data to actually go through to study, uh, to look for exoplanets. So um, we're still studying it. I believe you can still get on the website. It's called, if you look for the Zooniverse project, you can actually do, I think it's Star Hunter, but it's citizen science. If you're bored during your day, if you find yourself playing games on your phone or on a computer while you're waiting for emails to be responded to or meetings to start, uh, I highly recommend doing these. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is, um, exo, so it's exoplanets and you can actually go, oh, I think you tried to send a link. Yeah, I have links blocked. Sorry. Um, but I'll put a, a link in the description, but what you can do is you can actually go through the light curve data yourself in this universe project. And what it means is you can help them try to identify light curve dips because the human brain is actually really good at statistics. A lot of people would contradict that statement, <laughs> but we are very good at seeing trends. Our brain is very good at notif like seeing if there's a change in data and sometimes better than computers and better than we can program computers to mine data for things like this. So what they do is they've put a lot of Kepler data online. You'd go through a quick training thing. And if you can see these light curves, you can flag them. And then if more and more of them get flagged, then researchers will go and look at that specific data because it's a lot of data to go through. So even though Kepler is no longer taking data, we're st we still have a lot to study. And they just announced this week that they have found a new exoplanet in early Kepler data, actually, that is about the size of Earth and it's in the habitable zone. So when we talk about interesting exoplanets, it's usually one or the other that will find an Earth-sized planet but it might be too close or too far away from the star to possibly have liquid water on the surface, or it's in, um, or it's a planet that's in the habitable zone in the Goldilocks zone where it is possible to have liquid water just because of how much heat it's getting from the star, how far away from the star that it is. But we haven't found very many that actually tick both criteria and this one does. So it's called our new friend, <laughs> is called Kepler 1649C. I'm sure we'll come up with an interesting name for it 
anyway, it is 300 light years away. So it's orbiting a star that's 300 light years away. It is similar in size and in temperature to Earth. And that, the big and there, is the interesting thing. It's both size and temperature, which is awesome. And um, it is orbiting a small red dwarf star, the Kepler 1649. C is the number of exoplanets that it's found around there. And its orbit is 19 and a half days around the star. So it's zipping around the star. It's pretty close. But if you were here last time, or if you're new, I'll just kind of recap that these small red dwarf stars don't give out a ton of light. So planets, in order to have the possibility for liquid water, are going to have to be really close to them. It's similarly to if you have a campfire and when it's blazing and it's going, you're sitting pretty far away because you're comfortable and you're getting a lot of heat from that. As it starts to die down, you have to move closer and closer to be warm. And that's essentially how it works with these stars and the planets. If you want to have a planet in the Goldilocks zone around a cool star, you're going to have, not cool, you know what I mean, around a colder star, you're going to have to be closer to it in order to have a temperature that's amenable to having liquid water. So, um, this planet is close. It's orbiting about 20 days and, uh, but it's about the size of Earth and it's warm enough to have liquid water on the surface. There is a second planet there that is of interest and it is orbiting much closer. So it's too hot, but it's about half, it's almost exactly half the distance between this planet and the star. It's halfway in between, which is exactly how Venus is with us. We are twice the distance from Venus, uh, from the sun to Venus and then Venus to us uh, is about double the distance. You know what I mean. <laughs> and these planets are, are in the same thing, but they also have a ratio. They're in a um, orbital res resonance, which we talked about. Oh, excellent use <laughs> of the emote. Um, we talked about orbital resonance when we talked about the Jupiter's Galilean moons that three of the four of them are in a four two, one resonance orbit. So for every four of the closest one, the next, I think it's four of Io, then Europa orbits twice, and then Ganymede orbits once. So it does occur elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what we were talking about was how often this is seen. And they did see this, but this has a nine to four orbital resonant ratio. So for every nine times the inner one orbits, the outer one, the one that is Earth-like, orbits four times. So zip around nine, and then they meet at the same spot. It's gone, the outer one has gone around four times. But regardless of what the ratio is, the fact that there is a ratio, the fact that they meet at the same spot every time they go around shows that it's a very stable orbit. That's It's rare, as we talked about with um, Jupiter's moons, but the big thing, as I kind of looked into it and kind of thinking about it a little bit more, the big point is that it's a stable orbit. So if you see something in orbital resonance, it's stable. Uh, but it's really interesting. 300 light years away, a little bit out of reach from us, even with cool near light speed technology that we don't have, uh, we would still have to kind of break the laws of physics to get there in our lifetime. Um, I do briefly want to talk about that. Um, yeah, tidal force is that close to, but it's a low mass star. So thank you for bringing up the Sagittarius A star. I did not snag the image. Uh, I will do it next time though. So thank you for reminding me. In fact, let me make a note. Um, but we talked, I think two weeks ago about Sagittarius A star. And that is the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So when we look at the Milky Way in the night sky, we are looking down the plane of our own galaxy. If you look towards Sagittarius and Sagittarius A, you were looking right towards where the supermassive black hole is in the center of our galaxy. And so we've, you know, studied it. Looking down the Milky Way is tricky for astronomy because it's a lot of dust and gas and everything. But Sagittarius A star, the black hole, uh, we can observe, we know there's a supermassive black hole because we see stars that loop around it. They come close and then they fling off and then they come close again and they fling off. And it appears to be nothing there. We've since discovered that that's the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. And a lot of those observations were done in the late 90s and early 2000s. But as 
DTG mentioned, there was recently an announcement that we have now observational data of a star that is going around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy and it is processing as it goes. So I'm gonna try to do this. <laughs> it's really hard to do this to a camera when it's like you're looking at a mirror thing. But it's basically tracing out a flower shape. I have to look at my own finger as I do it. <laughs> it's tracing out a flower shape as it goes around this black hole. And, uh, and so we've observed that and we've observed that it's really close. And that also gives us more detailed information about the mass of the black hole because we can get the information on the mass of the star. Uh, I hope that was interesting. If there was something specific you wanted me to mention, but I will... Again, I'll try to find a link. I'll try to pull up the animation of it or the data that we have of it next week. Um, but thank you for reminding me about that. That was another cool space fact. If you ever see these, definitely throw, throw them to me. Oh, the really, oh, ah, excellent point. <laughs> yes, we will talk about it next week with the relationship to relativity. Thank you. You get full credit for bringing that in. Um, and how precession is a good proof of general relativity, which we still need even though we're getting data from ripples in space-time itself but yes how that is great for relativity and we will do that next week thank you for bringing that up and thank you for hanging out and sorry sorry i didn't have that planned for this one but um still cool stuff to to talk about so um thank you now uh i also had a question this week that i did answer on twitter but i wanted to bring up here because it was lovely and it was an adorable question about uh, what happens if you put jam or glitter on a spacecraft and uh it was from me Hal's kid which i appreciate sending in the question what would it still glitter if you had a spacecraft in space and it had glitter or jam on it i like the two comparisons <laughs> I think glitter shines a little bit more than jam. So you're going to get more reflection from glitter than you would from jam, but you would still have jam reflect some stuff. <laughs> and um, so a spacecraft would reflect light because light travels through space. It doesn't need a medium. It can travel through the vacuum of space. If it hits a spacecraft that has glitter on it, it will reflect off. The further apart, the further away from the sun it is, the less light it will reflect off, but it will still reflect. Uh, I did have my friend Rob Perlman chimed in to say that I have not at one at any time here ref, uh, reflected on the um, style choices, which are fantastic of having a spacecraft covered in glitter. But an interesting point to think about is this idea of solar, uh, solar not solar shields, um, solar, <laughs> you know what I mean. Sails, sails. <laughs> Thank you. Solar sails. See, I knew you knew what time meant. Um, if you were to cover a spacecraft in glitter, it's going to be highly reflective. Um, so you're going to get a lot of energy kind of bounce off when it when it reflects off or absorb. But it it did make me think about solar sails because we still have the light sail up in space and it is still taking data and sending back amazing images. If you don't know about solar sails, that's okay. If you are a Star Trek fan and saw the episode Deep Space Nine um, Explorers, you know something about solar sails. The idea is that you deploy a large sail that's highly reflective, possibly covered in glitter. The one that we have up there is not, but it's highly reflective. And so you have this huge solar sail and as the solar wind comes and it hits it, just the solar wind will hit it and it that's a force and the force causes that spacecraft to accelerate a little bit without any need for fuel because F equals MA force equals mass times acceleration. If you have the force from a solar particle or solar wind, you're very welcome. Hi, I'm glad you're here. If you have a solar wind or solar radiation, we'll hit this big glittering reflective shield. It will push it a little bit and it will accelerate it. And because we're in space, nothing is going to slow it down. So it's going to slightly accelerate to a speed and it's going to keep going at that speed. And it gets hit by more solar wind and it's going to accelerate more. As it gains this speed, it's going to keep going faster and faster. By the time that it is far enough away from the sun that it's not getting hit by very many solar particles, it's booking it. <laughs> and, and so it's a great, efficient, not, you know, non-wasteful really method of deep space travel 
because you can get a lot of energy just from the solar wind hitting this big glittery shield. So I recommend you looking up the Light Sail and the Planetary Society. They're the ones that have funded this and uh, and watching the Deep Space Nine Explorers episode if you haven't because they use a solar sail in it. <laughs> so um, anyway, cool, cool stuff. Now, let's uh, if glitter glued together it wouldn't look like alumin aluminumized, aluminized, aluminumized mylar. But yeah, probably. Excellent cosplay idea. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so let's let's transition over to our nighttime space stuff. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, <laughs> feel free to ask them here. Thank you for hanging out. I hope you have a good rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Um, I'm still here. He's going away. But we're going to talk about planetarium software stuff now. What is in the night sky right now? There's not a ton that's of particular note that we haven't really mentioned already. I will say that we are facing west right now. And this is just after sunset. I still have the atmosphere up. So sunset is happening around eight o'clock. So at 8.30, about your local time, <laughs> no worries, about your local time, uh, you can see Venus very clearly. Venus is highly reflective. Uh, it has that big, you know, it has a very bright atmosphere that reflects a lot of sunlight. We call it our, our, our star sometimes, our morning or evening star. That's from ancient astronomy and it's because right before the sun sets, when you can't see any other stars, you can still see Venus. Now a lot of people ask how you're able to tell the difference between a planet and a star when you look at the night sky. There's a few sort of ways that you can do it. One is, um, is just the flickering. So by the time light gets through our atmosphere, from stars, stars are so far away, they're effectively a single point for us, for our eyes. And as that light, as a single point, is coming through our atmosphere, our atmosphere is going to be bouncing that light around. That's why stars twinkle, because light is going to be bounced around a little bit and it's effectively one point. So we see it appear to wiggle a little bit, to twinkle, because it's a single point. But planets, even though they are still bright and they kind of look like stars, they don't twinkle because they're just a little bit bigger for what we're seeing. They're just a little bit bigger that the atmosphere doesn't have as much of an effect on what we view. So we don't see them twinkle. We don't see them sparkle in the night sky because they're not wobbling around because they're bigger than a single point for our eyes. So that's one way you can kind of tell. If you're not sure if a planet, if a star in the sky is a planet or a star, look for that twinkle. Now, planets are named as such because of ancient astronomers who identified that the planets were moving over time relative to the rest of the stars. So you would see this whole celestial night sky, right? You'd see this whole celestial sphere above you every night and every night it would slightly change position. Now this is as the earth is going around the sun, it's changing the relative position of the night sky, but it's all staying together, except for the planets. As the night sky is doing this throughout the year and all of the stars are staying relative to each other, these brighter non-twinkling objects were moving relative to that. And so the Greek word for wanderer is planet because they wandered relative to the background stars in the night sky. There's your fun fact <laughs> for your Friday. But it's interesting information and that's kind of where it comes from. Now, if you're really in a debate about where, if you're seeing a planet or not, uh, you can just pull up your free Skyview app on your phone and just point it at what you're looking and it'll tell you. It's ruined all late night, mildly imbibed alcohol fueled astronomy arguments <laughs> when we can just pull out our phone now and go, yep, yeah, nope, that's Saturn. I told you that was Saturn, but it's fine. It is what it is. And it is a great app. Um, the one I'm using right now is called Stellarium. It's good for laptops, PCs. It's all free. Uh, Skyview is kind of the equivalent for your phone and it, they both have night mode. So you can take them out at night and put on, if you change it to night mode, it'll be a red light filter. So your eyes will not have to adjust 
between once your eyes adjust to the stars and you're able to see a little bit more, looking at this app will not screw up your night vision. That's something astronomers have to deal with a lot. So anyway, fun facts. So the sun will set. I'm in LA. We're at Griffith, Griffith Observatory right now in the supposed farmland. <laughs> this is just the background uh, ground status. But the sun will set here. This will probably, you can see that Subaru cluster right there, the Pleiades cluster. Um, this, you might be able to see it, might not, uh, depending on the atmosphere and everything where you're at. But certainly Venus is going to be the most obvious thing. You can see the Orion constellation is sort of right behind it. And then as we progress through the night sky, hooray! Hey, Zach. <laughs> Happy Friday. Um, as we progress through the night sky, you'll see these will all set. They all kind of follow because the background night sky is moving the way it is because Earth is rotating. It's hard to wrap your mind around. I know everyone knows that. It's still good to remind yourself. My mother, bless her, has the hardest time with this. She hates the term sunset. She thinks it should be earth rotate away because <laughs> it breaks her brain every time she has to think about it. Uh, but you can see all these stars over time start to start to set. And then if we look east where the sun is going to rise, you can see the Milky Way here. If we're looking east, then this is 2.30 in the morning. You'll see the planets start to rise about 4 in the morning. Then you'll get the moon Oops. Oh, oh God. I didn't want to do that. Anyway, we are where we need to be. <laughs> I don't know. How to, oh yeah. It's just, is that? Nope. We are not going to mess with Julian day. Don't worry about it. We are where we need to be, but the moon rise will happen. Uh, I think it is currently a wax. Yeah. Waxing crescent moon right now. So it was just full or it was just new. And now it's starting to, um, think might still be getting smaller. I should really remember to write that down. Um, but the moon is going to rise right before sunrise and then the sun will rise there. No, it's waning crescent. It's almost going to be a new moon. It moves day to day. It moves in the opposite direction. See all these tricks you learn when you're in astronomy. <laughs> um, but Mars is what I wanted to spend sort of our last sort of 20 ish minutes talking about because Mars is awesome. You can see these are all lined up here. This is what we call the ecliptic plane um, that uh, because all those planets are in alignment with the sun, they are all in alignment here, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I want to center on Mars and let's zoom in. Let's go visit Mars and we can have a nice imported picture. It We just went well beyond light speed <laughs> to get this close to Mars. Um, you have Phobos and Deimos, moon, Ma Mars, moon one, Mars, moon two. They are roughly potato shaped. They are pretty cool objects. Um, and then what we are looking at here is we're looking on the other side of Mars that is not normally the one that most people associate or get super excited about, but you should get excited. So I'm going to tell you some of the cool things that I love about Mars. Again, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in, but we are going to talk about Mars. And I'm going to take off this targeting so we don't have to worry about that. So looking at Mars, we're looking at down here. This is called Hellas Planitia. Yes. Uh, it is the largest visible crater in our entire solar system. All the planets, all the planets, all the moons, all the everything. This is, oh, thank you for the follow. This is the largest visible crater in our solar system. Now, the cool thing about this, I mean, other than it just, that's a cool fact about it, but I love talking about Mars. If you look at a topogra topographical map of Mars, you see Hellas Planitius on one side, and on the other side, you see Olympus Mons, those other volcanoes, all extinct, and Mariner Valley, Valles Marineris which we have established because we've been able to get good enough imagery of it was not formed from eroding water like the Grand Canyon was. It's Mars's Grand Canyon, but it's more of a crack than it is an actual um, erosion that happened. So the question is, do we know how big the body that collided with it was? We don't, and we don't necessarily know. We're still trying to study exactly when that happened, but there are some hints to it. 
first of all, it does look relatively fresh, especially with this imagery that we have here. Um, it does have craters on top of it. So when you have a planetary object or any sort of solar system object, you can look at the craters and see how, um, see how fresh it is. How deep is that crater? That is a really, really good question. And I don't know that off the top of my head, so we're going to look it up. Uh, is I'm, I do not have a lot of stuff memorized, but that's okay. Um, so it's about seven kilometers deep. So it is deep and, uh, especially relative to, um, so it's always hard, right? When you don't have a sea level, <laughs> when you don't have sea level, what is sea level? How do we say how deep something is, but they do the average surface and then everything beyond that, I think is how they calculate sea level here. And uh, so we're trying to figure out how old it is. And if a star system, if a planetary system doesn't necessarily have an atmosphere, then that helps us a little bit because we can count how many craters hit it. And you can get a sense for how, um, how long it's been there. If it has an atmosphere, it screws you up a little bit more because you are not able to necessarily see the erosion over time, like it, the atmosphere erodes away the craters. And so you don't know how long it's been there for. So anyway, all of that aside, you asked how, how long ago, um, or we were talking about how long ago it might've happened. The important thing with this is trying to figure out the history of Mars in general, which is hard to do. So, um, Mars is half the size of Earth. It has about one third of the gravity, but it's half the size of Earth. Now, it doesn't have any liquid water on the surface anymore. We did establish that there was liquid water back in the past because I think it was might have been opportunity. One of the previous rovers to Curiosity took imagery of rocks that would only have formed in water. They were like river rocks. And so that was an indication that there had been liquid water on the surface at some point. What Curiosity discovered was, if you've been following me for a long time, you know I'm terrible with this word. I did literally write it down. Sedimentary. <laughs> Curiosity found sedimentary rocks. If you remember from school, those are layered rocks. I remember layered rocks. I can never remember sedimentary because I always want to go stratospheric and I always screw up. Anyway, sedimentary rocks on the surface of Mars, which meant, yes, there was liquid water, but there was liquid water for a long period of time where you had layers of rock layer on each other over a period of time. It was deposited by water, formed, then more water deposited, more layers, and they formed. So sedimentary rocks indicate that there's liquid water standing for a long period of time. So what happened? Well, in order to have liquid water on the surface of Mars, you have to have an atmosphere. If you have to have liquid water anywhere, you have to have an atmosphere. If you were here at the beginning of this hour, we were talking about the new um, exoplanet that we discovered, which is within a habitable zone and it's Earth size. But if it doesn't have an atmosphere, it's not going to have liquid water on the surface because you need that air pressure to keep it in liquid form. Some of you may have done this before. I used to love kind of scaring kids <laughs> with this experiment, but if you can get like those cheap bell jars and, uh, and make a vacuum chamber, like a simple vacuum chamber, you put a glass of water inside the vacuum chamber. If you suck out all the air, the water will start to boil. It's not boiling because it's hot. It's boiling because there's no air pressure keeping it in liquid form. It's really good to kind of scare kids to <laughs> stick their finger in. It's mean and you should try it at home, but it's fun. Anyway, you need an atmosphere to keep water in liquid form. So when it comes to Mars, it had liquid water. It had liquid water for a long period of time. That meant that it had to have a significant atmosphere for a long period of time. So what happened to the atmosphere? <laughs> now this gets very cat that ate the rat that, you know, it can get kind of chainy real fast, but that's how, that's how science works. There's a lot of cause and effect here. If we wanted to have an atmosphere, how would we have that? And what happened to it now? <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you enjoy it. So you need that atmosphere. What happened to it? Where did it go? In order to have an atmosphere, the reason earth 
happily has an atmosphere and keeps our water in liquid form is because we have a magnetic core. We have a rotating metallic core in the center of the earth, which creates a magnetic field. Compasses point north because of this magnetic field. And what that magnetic field is doing is acting like a massive shield from solar radiation. So we get bombarded by solar wind, but our magnetic field protects us. It is literally like a force field, like a shield. Hits our, our magnetic field and gets deflected around us. Some of that solar wind gets trapped in the magnetic field, spins up the lines, all this, uh, these radiated particles from the sun, spin up the magnetic field lines, get directed toward the north or south poles. When they hit the atmosphere, that's your northern or southern lights. So uh, that's, that's what happens when we get uh, these solar wind gets trapped in our magnetic field, hits the atmosphere, northern or southern lights. So pretty cool. Anyway, the fact that we have this molten core is what gives us a magnetic field, which protects our atmosphere, which allows there to be liquid water on the surface. Right. I'm glad you're all with me. <laughs> so with Mars, we know it had liquid water, meant it had to have had an atmosphere. What happened to that? It doesn't have a magnetic core anymore. It doesn't have a molten magnetic field anymore. There are two possible explanations for this. One, Mars is half the size of Earth. If you took two loaves of bread out of the oven, one is half the size of the other. The one that's half the size is going to cool off. It's going to cool off faster than the larger one. So one thought that's not as exciting is that Mars simply cooled off. Now it gets into a lot of discussion of planetary evolution and how long a planet would have to have a magnetic core in order to have an atmosphere, all of that sort of thing, which we don't have to get into now. But if it cooled off, it just meant that that molten core solidified, right? It was hot, it cooled off, it solidified, magnetic field disappeared, solar radiation blew the atmosphere away, all of the water evaporated. That's one way to think about it and completely valid. The other explanation, which is my favorite because it's apocalyptic, <laughs> is Hellas Planitia, that little thing. Hellas Planitia is so big that the thought is, and we have all this stuff on the other side, that the um, this impact happened, it cracked, it bulged the other side, which looks to be the case, right? We can kind of compare the two, looking past each other and doing, you know, having geologists and everything, planetary geologists study this. But because we have this, all of this volcanic activity, we know that there were volcanoes. We know there was a molten center at one point, not just because there was an atmosphere, but because we have these volcanoes. And we have Mariner Valley, which we know is a crack. It's not formed by um, water erosion. So the idea was is that this hit Mars, cracked the surface, and was so disruptive that it basically screwed, you know, exposed the core, screwed up the entire inner dynamics of Mars, caused it to cool off, disrupted the magnetic field, which meant that the... Um, the solar wind blew the atmosphere away. Now the question about the solar flare is really good. Now solar flares do hit earth and uh, they happen occasionally. The sun is on a cycle of about 11 years of being high solar activity and low solar activity. Um, I'm not going to get into, we can save that for another week talking about how solar flares work, what they are and all of those things, but they're basically just a huge push of radiation. Imagine a rubber band snapping, and sending off all of this radiation into space. And when it does, you get blasted by radiation particles. Now, when they do hit our magnetic field and our, and, and our atmosphere, there is some disruption. So there is a bit of a disruption to our magnetic field and uh, there's a lot of ionization that happens, which means we had a lot of energy hit the particles and it caused them to ionize. It disrupts satellite communications. It, it, a big solar flare can cause a lot of destruction. So we'll save that for a whole other week <laughs> where we talk about what solar flares are and what they do. Some cool stuff there. I'm going to remember to talk about it. Um, but it would not be, especially because Mars is further away from us, it would not be as, it would not have hit as hard. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's an 
excellent point that Mars doesn't have tectonic plates. And the question is why Mon Olympus Mons is so big. That's a really great question. And that's something that geologists have tried to figure out. The combination of having these massive volcanoes as well as Mariner Valley is what leads people to think that Mars, even though it had a molten core center, which we know it did because it had volcanoes and because it did have an atmosphere because of the magnetic field, we, we think that this crater impact caused those volcanoes to form. Now they could have also just been fissures in the surface that allowed molten lava to go up and form and go up and form. And, and as you mentioned, it's an indication they don't have tectonic plates because if there was tectonic motion, those plates would move away from this hot spot. So you would get a chain of volcanoes. We do see some, what you can say is a chain of volcanoes on Mars, but they're all just clustered together. So it's like taking four or five random points and you can probably draw a line through a couple of those. So it's hard to tell, but all of the things that we've talked about are all indications that Mars does not have tectonic activity and the, the geologic activity that we have seen in the past from those volcanoes we haven't seen, we've seen evidence of them is due to this massive crater impact. So this massive crater hit Mars, cracked the surface, bulged the other side, seriously looking up, um, tectonic, um, not tectonic, uh, topo topographical maps of Mars, you can see super dipped on one side, super raised on another. It's pretty cool. Now, again, because we can't recreate this experiment in astronomy, we just have to take whatever data comes our way. Unfortunately, we can't say with a hundred percent certainty that one or two of those things is what happened to Mars, but we can run simulations. We can try to get as much data as we can about this. So if Mars had, Mars did have to have had a magnetic field in the past because it had to have had an atmosphere in the past. The reason it had to have had an atmosphere is because we have found sedimentary rocks. Did you notice I had to look again? <laughs> because we found sedimentary rocks on the surface of Mars, which indicates long lasting water. Now, another thing I've mentioned before, which is fun to think about, Curiosity has also discovered possible subsurface water on, on Mars. So it is found because it has a ton of sensors. It doesn't just take cool selfies. Although the selfies it does take are pretty brilliant. Look up Mars Rover selfies. They will cheer you up guaranteed, <laughs> but it takes, it takes pictures and it has a ton of other sensors too. And it is trying to, you know, probe underneath the surface in various ways to try to figure out what's there. It has found possible evidence of water under the surface. However, curiosity is not allowed to dig for it. It can dig and take surface samples otherwise, but if it finds evidence that there might be liquid water under the surface, it cannot dig for it. And that is because we follow the prime directive. <laughs> and I talked about this a little bit when we talked about Europa, but if we find liquid water on any other body in our solar system, that's a good place for us to search for extraterrestrial life. Now it might even be microbial extraterrestrial life and that's okay, but it's a good place to start. Europa is a great place because it is churned by the tidal forces. So it has a warm saltwater ocean. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. So if you want to go check that out, um, we have our, our Galilean moon discussion where we get into why Europa is awesome. <laughs> but if you have any specific questions, feel free to throw them out here because I'm, I'm happy to answer them. But Europa has a warm saltwater ocean. Curiosity was not planning on finding subsurface oceans. We think that there might be some, we don't know how big they are. They're probably more like lakes than oceans, but it's digging under the surface. Curiosity was not cleaned enough to do that. So we talk, it, it is the prime directive. There's a more formal term for it, but it's the prime directive that we don't want to introduce bacteria from earth into water anywhere else for two reasons. One, that's mean. <laughs> 
you don't know what water is going to, you know, you don't want to introduce bacteria into water, particularly somewhere like Europa, which has warm saltwater ocean. You do not want to introduce bacteria there. But more importantly, imagine you dug into water, into a lake under the surface of Mars, and you detected bacteria. That would be amazing. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Prime directive. That would be amazing to uh, find bacteria. That would be that's extraterrestrial life. If we found bacteria on any other planet, we it would change everything. I would I'd be having a raging bender. Right now it wouldn't be anywhere than other my own patio, but I would be partying my brain out to find bacteria on another planet, moon, whatever. Um, but we have to be so certain that we didn't bring it ourselves. You do not want to be that person. <laughs> to drop that in. <laughs> exactly. The whiskey be flowing. <laughs> um, that you would have to be so sure that it didn't come on your spacecraft land and get introduced. And then you went, Hey, we found bacteria. Realize that you brought it yourself. That would be, that would be egg on the face to the max. So, Ooh, Titan is a good one. I do. We're going to talk about Titan another week too. dedicate a whole hour. Well, half hour to talking about Titan because it is awesome. And that is another great place for extraterrestrial life. One of my favorite facts about Titan is when the sun becomes a red giant, which is billions of years in the future. It's going to be at the end of its life, uh, but it's going to expand so much that it's going to get about to where we are. So it's going to expand out to about where Earth's orbit is. But by that time, Titan will be kind of a nice place to live. So if we're still some form of us possibly is still around, then we'll just hightail it to Titan if we haven't already. So, um, really cool stuff, but it's important to think about that if we are finding bacteria, we want to be sure we haven't done that. And there's another example. I don't know if Professor Noor is still on the chat or not, but he brought up an example of this happening, not the extraterrestrial life, but of introducing contagions into your experiment was when they were doing tardigrade studies into horizontal gene transfer. I've learned so much biology from having to do Star Trek. Um, but the uh, horizontal gene transfer, there was a paper that was published that claimed massive, extensive horizontal gene transfer in tardigrade DNA. That paper had to be retracted because they had contaminated the bacteria or the, the DNA with stuff that was, they basically ground up the tardigrades and ground up everything that was with the tardigrades and mistook all of the DNA that they got from that as just purely tardigrade DNA. So not great scientific practices, unfortunately, but it happens. And extraterrestrial life would be such a monumental discovery. You have to be so sure that you didn't screw it up. I mean, similarly, when I worked in LIGO searching for gravitational waves, it was the same thing. You know, since then they've discovered gravitational waves, but we were so, there was so much built into making so sure that we were claiming the actual discovery for what it was. That's a big, important thing to think about and, and important to scientific practices. Uh, so we just have a few more minutes left. If we have any last questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Again, I do recommend searching for Mars Rover selfies, the European Space Agency's Rosetta YouTube videos. They're just adorable. They make your day. Um, <coughs> so the question about the Mars One program of human settlement. So real thing, just an idea. Great question. The Mars One program separately as soon as I looked into it, it was basically like a single one way trip to Mars. Would you do a one way trip to Mars? I would consider it until I read the fine print <laughs> of the Mars one program, which was basically like, we'll send you there with finite food and then you'll run out of food and then you'll die. There was no like long term sustainability for that. So not only was they not going to send like a return spacecraft, they were just going to send you with what you got. And then you would say, Hey, I'm living on Mars until you're not living on Mars. <laughs> so that one is not as possible. I do think in terms of actually, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think in terms of actually, and this is where we need my red shirt emote. That's the next one. <laughs> so, um, 
But yeah, that'd be the ultimate red shirt away mission. Just go to Mars. You got a few weeks worth of food and we wish you well. But the, uh, <laughs> the idea about settling Mars in, in, uh, in practice is possible, but it's really hard. I think the hardest thing, the question isn't if we can get there. We can get there. I'm not worried about getting us to Mars. The question is the radiation. The radiation is going to get you. Again, we were just talking, this is a great question because we were just talking about this, but Mars doesn't have any protection from solar radiation. So not only are you exposed to radiation during your trip, once you get there, you are constantly bombarded by solar radiation. So we'll still have to figure out how to mine, you know, the icebergs for some atmosphere, some water. That's possible. There's frozen water on Mars. There's possibly lakes under the surface of Mars. Uh, you'd have to have some hydroponic system to grow plants. That's all possible. But that radiation is going to get you. And I don't think we've figured that out enough yet. There is, I think, I don't want to throw out a number because it would just be pulling out a random number. But I know people have looked at like how deep under the surface you would have to live in order to live on the surface of Mars. And it's not insignificantly deep. Um, yeah, isn't it just called Mars? I think that National Geographic program... It's, is that the one? I think that's the one you're talking about. It, that is a really good program. It's like part sort of narrative, part documentary. Uh, another high, high recommendation is called Packing for Mars. It's a book and it's by Mary Roach. Uh, Packing for Mars, highly recommended. She goes into all of the details, the beautiful and the gory, and it's not entirely safe for under 16 years old, probably, because we talk about reproduction and what that would be like and and all of that stuff. But it's fascinating. It's really, really interesting. And um, Mars is tough. And it's not an easy thing. But it's a challenge, right? Bring it on. People ask me a lot. I think I just got asked recently on a podcast about this too, is why do we spend our money in space? Why don't we spend our money focusing here on Earth? And it's because space is, there's lots of reasons. Space is beautiful. It's a unifier. It, you know, it's borderless, all of these things. But it's also really difficult. It's really, as, you know, McCoy said, it's dark and scary. <laughs> and, um, yeah, Mary Roach is amazing. But it's dark and scary and really difficult to conquer. And it gives us a challenge that we have to overcome. So it, uh, I do hope that we land on the surface of Mars. I would love to land on the surface of Mars. Um, really briefly, I know I said I was going to be an hour, but it's a good time to bring this up anyway. But... I talked about the atmosphere on Mars. I love when The Martian came out. Some people kind of forgot that that wasn't based on a true story. It's not a true story. It is a great story. Yeah, danger and disease wrapped in darkness and silence. Space. <laughs> Hashtag space. And, um, but on, in The Martian, we talk about the atmosphere on Mars. Remember, it's, there is an atmosphere, but it's not big enough to have liquid water on the surface. The atmosphere pressure on Mars is only 0.6% what it is here on Earth. So that vacuum chamber thing that I, I talked about with the museum, if you just had a simple belt chamber that you had this experiment on, that that vacuum that you create is about what the atmospheric pressure is on the surface of Mars. So in The Martian, the biggest scientific flaw in that film, and it's a great film and it's a great story, but the biggest scientific flaw is the fact that you do not have enough air pressure to actually push over a satellite to knock into Mark Watney or to knock over your spacecraft. But that was a very dedicated choice by the author, Andy Weir, because he didn't want the accident to be caused by the humans that were on the mission. He wanted the accident to be environmental. There are dust storms on Mars, as we know, and all it does is obfuscate your vision. So this, the dust on the surface of Mars is kind of the texture of baby powder that it gets kicked up. And again, it's half the gravity of Earth. So it takes a long time to get settled down. So that slight, slight atmosphere, if any of it possibly kicks it up, it's more that those dust particles are then going to kick up more dust particles that are going to kick up more and, uh, and then it takes a long time to settle down. So if you were in a dust storm on Mars, you wouldn't be able to see, but you wouldn't feel any air pushing on you. Um, yeah, it'd be like a dust fog. That's a great, great analogy for that. You wouldn't be able to see very well, but you wouldn't feel anything pushing on you just because we feel wind because of, of air pressure. So 
Um, we will leave it at that. I want to thank you all for hanging out again. I really appreciate it. Uh, if this is kind of your first time here, if you happen to drop in because you were killing time on a Friday afternoon, welcome. I do have a YouTube channel. You can check out the link below where I post these if you want to share these with anyone. Uh, I also, my schedule will pop up when I'm done with this, but I do some random stuff throughout the week. This is our astronomy club time. So I want to thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, you can feel free to follow me, uh, subscribe if you're so inclined. I think if you have a Prime membership, you can subscribe to a channel for free for a month, which is always helpful. You that, and then you get some of the, the cool emotes that we've got. But um, yes, the dust storm at the beginning of Mass Effect 3 is wrong. But, ooh, who Mass Effect question. But the lightning on the storm in Mass Effect 3 is real. We didn't think that there would be lightning on storms in Mars, but we did actually detect lightning in a dust storm on Mars. So that is that is possible. So thank you. I'm glad you were here. I talk about science and science fiction and uh, background in astrophysics. So I'm always happy to do it. I'm glad you found me. And thank you for the follow. And it was really good to spend some time on a Friday with you. So have a good rest of your day. Get up, stretch, drink some water. Take care of yourself. I love you all. Um, space is beautiful. Remember to look up. And yeah, take care of yourselves. All right. Well, until next time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>